great to have you all here with us today, seeking the Lord together. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Henry Spalding. Um, Dr. Spalding, I don't know if you saw the bulletin or not, but your picture's on it. And uh, Jessica, our administrative assistant, she, she graduated from Mount Vernon. And I just want to say, I've been here 20 years. My picture's never been on the front of the bulletin. <laughs> so this is a, a great thing that we have you with us today. So Dr. Spalding is here with his wife, Sharon. He's the seventh president of Mount Vernon Nazarene University, has served in that role since 2012. When the economy tanked a number of years ago, I think it was a real big challenge for all uh, private schools. And he has led our university really well through that. And uh, things are, I, I understand, going very well at Mount Vernon Nazarene. And so we're delighted to have you, Dr. Spalding. It's truly an honor. We've never had a president from any of our universities. So this is a real blessing. And, and, and we're just so glad that you guys would be here together and, and spend this time with us. Um, I want to just mention a few things. And I've probably missed some people, but there are at least five couples in our church who met each other at Mount Vernon Nazarene University and married. There are, um, we have one of the larger families, but uh, Gus and Bev sent all three of their kids to Mount Vernon, and now Corinne is at Mount Vernon. So that's the Bosworth family, uh, and, and also Colleen, had sent, uh, Colleen and Fred sent Kayla. So anyway, that's three generations um, that has a connection at Mount Vernon. So I think that's a big deal. We have at least nine sets of parents in our church who sent one or at least one child to Mount Vernon Nazarene. So nine who are currently here who sent at least one child to Mount Vernon. Three current students. And it would be hard for me to count up all the people who have attended or are alumni there. But anyway, we have a real strong connection with Mount Vernon. And so even more so, it's an honor to have you with us and so welcome, Dr. Spalding. We, we're excited to hear from you. Come and share with us this morning. Well, it's certainly a privilege. Does that sound too loud to you or is that right on? Well, good. You know, uh, you never know. Um, I don't want to blast you out. I come from the South where they preach loud. Uh, and uh, I'm not exactly like a southern preacher because I've lived uh, since 18 most of my life above the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, but uh, uh, it's good to be here. It's good that this church has so many people who have passed through the university, including your pastor. And it's always good um, to be in a Nazarene church in our region or a Nazarene church uh, at all. Uh, we've had a good year. You know, this year's not been the uh, the happiest year all along, but uh, it has. Uh, it's a year in which uh, our finances are in order. We have uh, more students than we've ever had in the last. We've had in the last nine years on campus. Uh, God seems to be bringing strong people to be um, join us. Uh, Brad coaches nearby here will be joining us. Uh, and uh, Jill Ballinger is going to join us all this month. Uh, we have this year uh, hired a, a, a new uh, mechanical engineer. Surprising how much engineers make in industry and how little they make by comparison with us. But it's a beautiful young uh, Chinese woman who just received her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. She's already having an impact on us. Along with our new psychology professor, we're, we're beginning to incorporate a number of different uh, nations uh, among our faculty, and we've always had them uh, among our students. Uh, last year, we celebrated our 50th year, and so this is year 51. I always, always take uh, note that uh, I met my wife on the 4th of the month that the university began its, opened its doors. So... Our relationship is older than actual opening. I realized that in 1966 it was authorized, but it took a little, a little bit of a while to, um, to get that um, uh, organized. And, and even at that, they opened without a, a lot of classroom space. Uh, they didn't have a lot of things that they have now. In fact, now uh, we're full operation. We're not Ohio State, don't want to be. Uh, although, if our teams could be that good, we'd dominate our conference. Uh, but we do pretty well uh, as it is. It's a, it's a beautiful place to be and to interact with our students. 
There's only one really good reason to go to Mount Vernon Nazarene University, and that is you get the college education that you need for your life in a community that is Christian, that's devoted uh, every day to doing what we do by the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of our Heavenly Father. We, uh, we certainly have plenty of work to do, but I'm happy for where I'm at and where the university's at uh, right now. So thank you for your support over the years to the university, uh, and um, thank you for your support, especially the families who ought to have streets named after them, as many uh, as some of them, some of you have brought to us. I want to talk to you today simply about the gospel of flesh and bones. And if you want to have a Bible, and I realize most of the time it's thrown up on the screen, I, I, I live in technology, but I've never really integrated my preaching with it. Uh, maybe it would help, I'll see. My son does. Uh, it is uh, certainly the gospel of John speaks directly to this issue. So I'm going to read this with you. And you've been standing a lot, uh, but in your heart stand in respect to God's word. But I want to read this passage to you the old-fashioned way, out of a book. This one. I admit it's in what you might call comfort print these days. But uh, that makes it easier for me to read it. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I read a line this morning from uh, James K. A. Smith and says, evil is overcome by the gospel and certainly by Jesus. Jesus looks straight into the darkness and he overcomes it because he's the light of the world. There was a man sent from God whose name is John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone who, who's, who was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him and yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who, are received, who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of the man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace, grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. Let's pray just a word. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your good word and for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for this gospel that you have entrusted to us to live into and from in this world. Bless us this morning as we think for just a few minutes about this magisterial prayer. Uh, passage. We pray this in your name. Amen. Certainly this is one of the most often read passages of scripture at Christmas, but it's not necessarily a Christmas passage. I don't 
resent anybody who does that, and I've done it myself. But this passage takes us from Bethlehem to Sinai and then to Calvary. While Christmas is on our mind when we read that, we need to understand that what this passage comes to teach us is this. God, something that we will only on our tiptoes begin to comprehend, came and the actual Greek tabernacled among us, dwelt among us, and we touched God's face in his son Jesus Christ. That God could do that and that God would say to us in that situation, Flesh and bones bear, can bear the gospel. That's good for us. Because life is lived with flesh and bones. Simple things. I, my father passed away a little over a year ago at the age of 91. He had for the last uh, two years lived in assisted care. And I watched a once strong and Vital man, opinionated man, a man you either liked or didn't like, but he was strong. He was an accountant. His name will never be written down in any great place. But he was a flesh and bones kind of guy. He never had anything really nice. I mean, we had a nice enough house. Rain stayed off of us. The bugs stayed off at night. And that says a lot in Florida. Because they're everywhere. The bushes are alive with snakes and bugs and birds and other things. He, the only suit I know for sure he ever got, he got in a bag from J.C. Penney's. And I'm not talking about the bag they put over a hanger. The suit came in a bag. It was polyester. The fabric that does things for you that no other fabric will. It offers space when you didn't think there was. And he had uh, several of those kinds of things. Uh, he uh, had, a, had an old wallet. And that wallet was that thick. Well, there was money in there to be sure, but it was pictures. It was his photo album. He didn't know anything about this digital stuff. It's all he could do to make a phone call on his cell phone. Or answer it when you got it, when he got one. But he felt like he needed one, so we bought one for him and my mother. And my mother passed away several years before him. When he put that wallet in his back pocket, it looked like he had a growth on his behind. (laughs) But when I think of that wallet, I think of him. I think of where and how I grew up. I am reminded that some of the most important things in life are flesh and bones. And it's important for me to know that God came in flesh and bones to redeem us, to save us. These, These verses tell us that the God of the universe, the God of creation, the triune God that nobody can fully understand what we can mimic and say things about, that he came in flesh and bones. I want to look a little bit with you this morning at that gospel of flesh and bones. The first one, I would, first point I would like to make is that, that you see here is God comes to where we are. Now you can bear in mind as you live your life. God's not just your co-pilot. In fact, he is your pilot but he sits with you and walks with you and talks with you and tells you the story of salvation. If we look at verse 14, and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of, as of a father's only son. God comes and he heals. He redeems. He strengthens. He encourages us. He shows us the way. The grace of God is not a principle. It's a people. It's flesh and bones. 
When we moved to Nashville, Tennessee, where I lived for 12 years on the fa- and taught uh, for 12 years on the faculty at Trevecca Nazarene University, where I went to school, where my wife went to school, where all my children went to school um, and graduated, thankfully. When I first moved there, my son, who now has a PhD in Christian ethics, was in second grade. We went to his first night to meet the teacher uh, deal, and they had out on the, on the hallway of that school all these pictures that the students in the class had drawn. When I grow up, I want to be a policeman. That's an all-time favorite. Fireman, doctor, nurse, teacher. And I came to my sons, and he says, I want to be my dad. And I took great comfort, but also the burden of knowing that all my life he, he has been looking at me. And what I do affects him. Fast forward a few years, he's at Trevecca. We've just left to go to teach at NTS, Nazarene Theological Seminary. I just finished a, a seminar that night, a once a week kind of seminar. And I, when, I, when I got on the road, I saw a text that was waiting for me. Dad, if I drop all my classes, would you come here and pick me up and take me to where you are? Well, that's not a very pleasant thing to hear. He was a sophomore that by that time. And I looked at him, or didn't, couldn't look at him, I, I called him immediately. And it's about a 45-minute drive from the, where I was living to where the seminary was located. And during that period of time, he... Uh, He poured his heart out to me like he's done very few times in his life, maybe the only time in his life. And what he essentially said was, I'm not doing well here because I'm not you. And everybody expects me to be you, to know what you know and to speak like you speak. And I said, Hank, when I was 18, I wasn't me. You don't have to be me. You have to be faithful to the gifts you have, which are tremendous. And I said, but the first thing, first question you asked was this. Will I come get you? Yes, I will come get you. And I will bring your stuff to where I am. But you're going to graduate from school. You're not going to wait dealing with that. Now, he cried some that night. There's lots of things. It's a terrible thing in some ways to be in a situation where you have higher expectations for yourself than when you ought to. A lot of people don't have high enough expectations. But his expectation was he wanted to be me. I don't know why. I've got cracks in the wall just like anybody else. But on that night, I resolved this, that that boy needed to understand that Jesus was a God of flesh and bones. And on that ride home that night, what mattered most was was him to recognize that who he ought to be imitating and who he is imitating is the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he has worked with a number of students over the years, uh, passed out his own understanding the gospel and all the rest. And I could replay 30 or 40 of of not that intense but strong conversations where he was at a crossroad in in the road. We We talked about it. The gospel, though, is about a God who comes to where you are. Because really and truly, none of us is really caught up in this image maybe we have of ourselves or other people have images of. I am a person my son is first. You are people who we live and breathe on the proposition that God comes to where we are to minister to us where we are and use the gifts we have to bless his church and to mature our character to the point that we will, fe- we will face him one day and hear the words, good and faithful servants, you've done a good job. That's all we want. The gospel of flesh and bones as Jesus illustrates us, it illustrates it and makes that point. Another issue is this, or another point would be, the gospel of flesh and bones means that God love, God's love finds us. 
your pastor before the church said, uh, I found. He said, no, no, he found me. None of us finds God at the end of an exhaustive rational search. He finds us where we are, and we have the opportunity to accept that. Bear that in mind. God doesn't wait in heaven with arms folded, waiting for us to somehow stumble on to him. God has always been and always will be reaching us through his love. If we look at verse 16, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. My younger daughter called me, she was working uh, in Mount Vernon, and she had to come toward uh, Newark, living in Mount Vernon, and go into Newark, and she called me up one morning in the middle of a, a appointment I had, and she said, Dad, you've got to come quickly. What's wrong, Megan? My car will not move. And I'm parked in a parking lot behind a law office in Newark. And really, I asked myself, how did your car move there? It's the first time she'd driven on snow like that. And, and she'd gotten herself, you know how it is where you get the wires, cars going, that thing won't move. So I brought my assistant with me. And we went there and I retrieved her. And she got into my car, and the assistant got in her car. Guess what? Her car moved. Snow is bad, but it is not like ice. Unless you make ice under your tires in the snow. Then it gets, she had a little Saturn, and I was driving a bigger Saturn, and so I was able to drive home and drive to her. When, when we need somebody, when we need something, and it's more important than where our car is parked and what we can and cannot do. It is good to know that God loves us enough to break into our life and show us a way out. Because ultimately, all of us don't climb our way out of our dilemma. We are carried out of that way by God, by Jesus who saves us. I have my limits. There are things I can do and things I can't. A few years before that, when I was at Trevecca, she had decided at 8 o'clock one night she was driving to South Carolina. Didn't think it was a good idea, but she was a, an adult. She had her own car and her own car keys, and off she went. I saw her calling me during the basketball game. I went out, she says, and she was in heaps of tears. And when she cries, she scream cries for a while, and so you just got to listen to that. To finally you just briefly say, Megan, listen to me. Okay, what? What was the last turn you made? What do you see out of your front windshield? I've asked her that question a hundred times in life. Because the girl still needs a garment to get to Walmart in her town. <laughs> which is Howard, Ohio. She has no sense of direction. But one of the great gifts of my life, not then, I bought her a Garmin. And now she gets anywhere she wants to. She only calls me when she won't obey the Garmin. And there are times like that too. But on that night, she was in a parking lot in Atlanta at 9.30 or 10 o'clock. I think it was 10 o'clock. It's pouring rain. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've got a daughter who is 20 years old and she's lost in a parking lot in Atlanta and you're in Nashville, it's a hopeless feeling. I know that Jesus could be with her and probably was, but I couldn't be in time to help her. And so she, sa she said, I, I went to a friend of um, my son who was his roommate lifelong friend of his, and he was from South Carolina. He'd driven through there to South Carolina the same way. And I said, how do you get from here to there? What are the interstates? He said, I don't know. I said, you are worthless. He's, he still remembers that. I didn't mean it really that pejoratively. I mean, 
you're worthless in this situation. You may be a great, and he is, I think he's a great guy. But um, we went to the store. And I don't know if you young people know this, but there used to be something called a map <laughs> that folds out. And it had one with the Atlanta Metroplex. We finally got her out of there. It took me an hour and a half to calm her down and do that. Now, why did I do that? Because I wanted to be a know it at all? I'm certainly not when it comes to roads myself. I got here because of a Garmin today that's installed in the vehicle, but still a Garmin. The reality of it is, I love that girl. I loved her so much that yesterday at 2 a.m., I drove her to the airport so she could go to Disneyland <laughs> or World, whichever one it is. Now, I've been there, done that, don't need to do it anymore. All of our kids, our younger kids think Disney World is, in fact, our son is in Disney World right now. They didn't go together because they don't like each other on the road, but they may intersect somewhere down the road. But all of us, at some point in our life, are lost. We don't know how it happened, or if we do, it doesn't make much difference. But we're lost. And we might ask, who cares that I'm lost? Who cares that I'm lonely? Who cares that I feel like I'm a failure? Who cares that I made a mistake that I don't think I'll ever be able to undo? The answer to that question rings right through this passage. Jesus cares. Jesus will be there. In fact, Jesus is already there. The fact that we can trust Jesus to do that because it is important because for God, love is not a concept we work with. It's an action that defines his life. When one time Hank was in high school, I don't know if you've ever been in Nashville, but Rivergate Mall on Black Friday, appropriately named, should call it Red Friday because of the taillights on the cars. He said he wanted to take his girlfriend to eat Mexican food. So they got through that, and it's on the other side of Rivergate. Why can't you go on the right side of Rivergate if you want to eat Mexican food? Because Taco Bell wasn't good enough. It was some other place. And he called me up in the garage. I was in the middle of something I needed to do. I wanted to do. I had to do. He called me up and said, Dad, my girlfriend, I don't know how she did she locked my wallet in the car, and now we got to pay. Put your wallet in your back pocket. He's convinced if he carries his wallet in the back pocket, it'll cause him ma massive back trouble. And my father had one. <laughs> and that wasn't what got him. It was just old age. I don't wear mine in the back pocket because it sticks out of the back pocket and I don't want pickpockets to get my wallet. They wouldn't get any money, but they might get a credit card or two. So guess who got dressed? And took his keys. Always, I always keep the keys in my kids' cars because they're, they're hard to keep track of. When you, you can leave them, well, anyway, you know how it goes you've got, if you've got children. If you're kids, don't put your keys anywhere but in your pocket when you turn it off. The ignition is good if you want to drive. It's not good if you're going to eat Mexican food and leave your wallet in there. But I'd like to know why she's the one that did it. He drove. It was easier for me to blame her anyway, or him too. The fact is that God loves us enough to come to us even when we make mistakes. Sometimes we think God wants us to be perfect. And that's the basis upon which he comes to help us. He doesn't help us because we're perfect. He helps us because he loves us. Well, I don't want my older daughter to be out of this. She's 41. She's a little older than the other two by eight years. PhD spelled those eight years. She had a boyfriend in, in college, and she loved him a little bit. And uh, he felt like, um, she felt like that uh, this was the kind of guy she deserved. But she got tired of him because he wouldn't pay enough attention to her, so she broke up with him. The night she broke up with him, I said to Sherry, this is hallelujah town. 
I didn't like him. He was a deadbeat, you know. <laughs> None of my daughters have ever dated a good guy, you know, even though I think I've, the one she did marry, I finally grew on me, but it took a while. But uh, she, I was sitting there in the bedroom. I have a chair in there where I read and look out the window and try and look smart if anybody walks by. But it's the backyard. Very few people did. And, um, and she said to me, we're not done talking. When were we talking? She says, you know we were. We're not talking. I, she sat on the end of the bed and she says, I'm a good girl. I do good work. I am a good looking person. She was, is. I deserve a boy that's good looking because I'm a Christian girl. I said, Shelly, you deserve a cross to bear for him. That's what you deserve. None of us approaches God and say, you, you, I deserve you to treat me better because of who I am, the quality of my life. The gospel of flesh and bones tells us this. God will give you the most precious gift you'll ever get. New life in him. That's more important than a boy. And she got a good looking boy, I guess. She tells me he is. And he's grown on me over the years. A little rough around the edges from uh, New Jersey. And um, so on and so forth. He's a nurse. She's a social worker. They got three kids. Which I affectionately call three tornadoes. They come into the room. She's built quite a life of herself for herself. Because she accepted the proposition, not that day, but somewhere down the road, that what I really need from God is new life. And then everything else flows from it. One more thing. A gracious gospel flesh and bones is that which comes to us and faces us and fills us with Holiness, you knew I'd get to that. And I'm, I'm really at this point talking about what that love does to us. It, it, it doesn't just bathe us. It redeems us and takes that flesh, and you know yours like I know mine, that can cause us to get interested in the wrong things and think the wrong things and do the wrong things. But somehow in the midst of that, that gospel comes to us not to take the flesh away, but to redeem it. And as Wesley said, talks about it, the expelling love of God. It's not that there are other things that we love. You know, the students at Trevecca know I love my suburban. I don't love it like I do my wife or my children. But when you get into a suburban, you realize that you have now arrived in life. You're above the foray. Now, what I've got out there is the loner because... Somebody T-boned me in Polaris, and so I'm driving an Escalade. It's not, and it's no better. It's the same thing with a different title on it and a higher price tag is what it is. But enough of that. What really makes the difference in life is that we can love a lot of things, but the love of Christ expels things we ought not to love, things that are unhealthy for us, things that we shouldn't love. And that's the whole meaning. Well, not the whole meaning. It's a great deal of what we mean by holiness. Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother, wrote this song. And I'm going to read the whole thing. Just read this part of it. Finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless let it be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory to glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. There are lots of ways to describe our full life in, in God, in, 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 in the very grace of God. But I think one of the, most, the greatest miracle of all is that God takes our flesh and bones 
And by his grace continues his perfection into us. A few years ago, my older daughter with her, I think then two children, there might have been three, it's hard to keep up, but there's three now. They came to town and one of my, my daughter's things was health food. Nothing's ever going, no sugar's ever going to touch my children's lips. And the great center there is ice cream. They can't have ice cream. I don't know what we did wrong with her. Uh, the girl denied her children ice cream. Goodness gracious. I might have said that to her too. So finally my wife predict, uh, uh, pre uh, presented a plan to her. We've got a place in town. It's not ice cream. It's custard. It's got active cultures in it. Sugar's one of them, but she didn't mention that. <laughs> and so we loaded up and took them to Wits. A gift of God to Ohio. Maybe other places, but we went in there and we got them a kitty cone. You know, that is a taste, maybe. Just a little thing. And when the older one, who's now nine years old, or eight, one of the nine, okay, he got his thing, looked at it, says, I don't like mayonnaise. <laughs> and then he touched it, and before it's over, that little thing was all over his face. <laughs> he loves frozen custard. And the others ate it up too. And what's the funniest part is my son-in-law got a banana split and he had that all over his face. <laughs> you and I know that the grace of God is like wits custard. It's so good you cannot get enough of it. From that day forward, every time we come home, my wife takes a whole bunch of ice cream. Not custard, ice cream. They love ice cream. You and I know, don't we? That in reality, no matter how much we love ice cream, it's our love and God's love for us that truly changes our life. We get a hint of it in Wits ice, in Wits custard. Hint of it in a pepperoni pizza. Hint of it in a suburban or whatever you drive. But the fact is, this gospel of flesh and bones, our flesh and bones will never be separated from God's capacity to love us. And that's how he does love us. Praise his name forever. Thank you. Church, let's pray. Maybe stand with me, would you? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come in uh, again, we are in your presence and, uh, and so grateful to be here, and we receive that word today, and, uh, and we are so blessed by this awesome grace and uh, the, the amazing gift of Jesus that you would send him to us, that, that we might be able to come and encounter the face of God. And Lord, for all that you've done for us, Lord, we receive it today, the forgiveness of sins, Lord, the love that you pour out upon us, the love that is actively just giving us blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace, we receive it today. Lord, for any in our church family who maybe have not yet taken the step of walking with you in relationship, Lord, we just, uh, we just declare today, Lord, that, that you are good. And Lord, to know you, to walk with you is the greatest experience that we will have in this life. And, and Lord, we receive today this message and we receive the 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 message of the gospel of flesh and bones, Lord, that you love us and you sent Jesus to us. And there is forgiveness of sins. And, and Lord, there is um, restoration and healing that we receive in you. And we are so grateful today and so blessed by all of the grace that you give us. We pray today in the name of Jesus. Church, God bless you. Um, we do want to receive our offering th this morning. So maybe just sit back down for just a moment and the ushers can come. And as they do that, can I just mention a few things? Um, again, um, 
Dr. Spalding and, and, and Mrs. Spalding, it was such a blessing to have you with us. Thank you so much. Um, I've invited them to stay, but I, they're busy. They may not be able to. It's, it's totally um, whatever you guys want to do, but you're certainly welcome to eat with us. But I would love for some of you to be able to meet them, um, and especially any of our teens that think maybe someday you'll go to Mount Vernon Nazarene. Love for you to come over and, and uh, be able to say hi to them. And then I just want to remind everybody that when we're done, everything should be ready under the shelter house. So we're just going to make our way back there. And when you get in line to get your food, um, there's a sign-up sheet for, for cornhole, uh, for the egg toss, and for a euchre tournament. And so we would love for you to, to be involved in some of those. So we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Let me pray for those as well. Lord, we also just pray for our meal that we're going to have out there, that uh, it would be a wonderful time, that we thank you for the food. And so many people, um, Lord, have volunteered to make food, and, and we're grateful for that. Would you bless us, Lord, with that food, and not only with the food, but with the fellowship, with an opportunity to, to get to know people better, to love one another, to encourage one another. Lord, it's a beautiful day that you've given us. This might be one of the last times we can really be outside and, and enjoy, um, Lord, your creation and your nature um, as a church family for this year. And so I just pray and ask that it would be a wonderful day. And Lord, we lift up our, our offering today and, and just pray, Lord, that everything we receive, that we would... that Lord, it would be used to honor you, to, to glorify you, that your will would be done with this offering. We pray that in the name of Jesus.